thank you for joining this session today. My name is Shalini Joshi, and I'm Program Director at Midan, a global nonprofit that focuses on improving the quality of online information. This session is titled, When the Facts Go Offline, Information Blackouts During Internet Shutdowns. The session is organized by Midan and Access Now. Access Now needs no introduction here at RightsCon. Um, it is a nonprofit with a mission to defend and extend the digital rights uh, of people around the world. Access Now supports programs including RightsCon and produces an annual index of internet shutdowns, um, something that I'll also be referring to later in the conversation. Uh, in this session, we are focusing on internet shutdowns and their impact in the Asia Pacific region. And we have speakers who represent different countries in the region that have experienced internet shutdowns and disruptions. There has been a sharp rise in internet shutdowns um, in Asia, and, and that has been quite alarming. As per the definition developed by the Keep It On Coalition, an internet shutdown is an intentional disruption of internet or electronic communications, rendering them inaccessible or effectively unusable for a specific population or within a location. Often this is to exert control over the flow of information. So an internet shutdown happens when um, someone, which is usually a government, intentionally disrupts the internet or mobile apps to control what people do or what they say. Democracies like India, Indonesia, Sri Lanka, uh, the Philippines, and many others uh, in the region um, are prodigious offenders. And so are Asia's more uh, repressive regimes like the military regime in Myanmar. Governments have often offered real and imagined threats to national security and electoral processes as reasons for shutting down the internet. Even though there is no evidence to show that internet shutdowns have resulted in reduced violence or control the spread of misinformation. Last year in 2020, Access Now documented at least 155 internet shutdown incidents around the world in 29 countries. In the year of the COVID-19 pandemic last year, and as more and more information and basic services opportunities, um, a lot of health related services moved online, the shutdowns have negatively impacted citizens by hindering access to healthcare, education, and often life-saving information. India has topped this list with 109 shutdowns in 2020. Myanmar has also witnessed one of the longest shutdowns affecting communities in the Rakhine and Chin provinces. And after the coup this year in uh, February, the military has severely restricted access to the internet, further stifling access to information in a country that has faced violence and political instability. In Indonesia also, the government has shut down the internet in Papua and West Papua provinces to silence protests taking place in these uh, regions. So what are the consequences of these shutdowns on people's lives? How do these impact the work of human rights activists, fact checkers and journalists? What are some of the strategies to mitigate the impact of shutdowns? These are some of the questions and issues we are hoping to address during this session. Uh, let me begin by introducing the speakers and the panelists that we have here today. Um, we have here Ramanjit Singh Chima. He's the Senior International Council and Asia Pacific Policy Director at Access Now. Thanks for joining us, Raman. Raman will make opening remarks about internet shutdowns and the spread of misinformation. We also have here Tai Tai Ong, who's the executive director at Myanmar ICT Development Organization, or MIDO. MIDO focuses on ICTs for development, internet freedom, 
and internet policy advocacy in Myanmar. Tai has been involved in Myanmar's internet propagation events since the introduction of the internet in Myanmar and is also a digital security trainer for human rights defenders. We have uh, Kritika Goel, uh, who's uh, associate editor at The Quint and leads its fact-checking team, WebGoof. The Quint is an independent newsroom in India. It strives to appease through its unbiased uh, looking glass. In the process, it constantly questions status quo, sparking relevant conversations along the way. Kritika covers misinformation and disinformation with a special focus on politics and breaking news stories. And she has worked as a journalist before she joined the Quint. We also have here Vayu Dhyatmika, um, who is the editor-in-chief of Tempo magazine in Indonesia. In 2015, Vayu led the Panama Papers reporting in Indonesia. In 2018, Vayu was involved in the creation of Check Factor, which is a collaborative fact-checking initiative. Vayu believes in journalism as a conversation between the public and the newsroom, and that is why he's always excited to experiment with different forms of citizen reporting in various digital platforms to find a better way for journalism to serve the public. Thank you very much, Kritika, Tai, and Vayu for joining us here. And um, we'll start the question now, um, session now. And at the beginning, uh, I'd like to request Raman to make opening comments about internet shutdowns and misinformation in the region. So over to you, Raman. Thank you so much, Ravani. And I just wanted to say good afternoon to all of you here at RightsCon or viewing this later recorded form or elsewhere from New Delhi. As Shalini mentioned, I lead the Asia Pacific work at Access Now, and I also coordinate different areas of our global work, of which internet shutdowns has become an increasingly active area of work and, and, and unfortunately a large amount of work, particularly from the Asia Pacific region, because a large number of the world's internet shutdowns take place out of the Asia Pacific region. More specifically, it's important to focus on what Shalini mentioned in terms of understanding what shutdowns are. Shutdowns are the intentional disruption of internet communications. It could be a total shutdown. It could be slowing down of internet traffic as a whole. It could be targeting of particular apps and services in a large systemic way. If, for example, those apps or services are critical to communication flow in a particular country, for example, messaging apps or certain forms of social media. But it essentially represents an intentional effort by a government agency, whether a federal government, state government, police actor, or somebody else in power, normally supposed to be have limited ability to restrict speech and expression, choosing to shut down the entire internet or restrict access to it. We, we run the Global Keep It On Coalition, which tracks and advocates for against internet shutdowns. It helped develop the definition of internet shutdown that Shalini mentioned, which in fact was an outproduct of a previous RightsCon, RightsCon San Francisco, a couple of years ago. And we have tracked regularly with the Keep It On Coalition, which has several uh, organizations, activists who are members of it globally, keep track regularly about the number of shutdowns that occur. And I thought it's useful to have a sense of the data there what takes place. And it's important to note that internet shutdowns are significantly have been growing, although we notice a trend more recently where the total number of shutdowns has reduced a little bit, but the intensity of the shutdowns has continued. And to give you data to help you know, color this, in 2020, the Keep It On campaign documented at least 155 internet shutdowns in 29 countries, of which the world's largest number of shutdowns, the world's worst perpetrator of internet shutdowns was unfortunately the Republic of India, uh, with nearly 110 plus shutdowns being ordered by the Indian government itself or by state government agencies across the breadth of the Indian Republic. Uh, some of the most intense internet shutdowns in 2020 were also located in the Asia Pacific region, specifically the long internet shutdown from 2019 into 2020 for Jammu and Kashmir in Indian, administer, in Indian admin, administered Kashmir and the Rakhine and Chin internet shutdowns in Myanmar. You notice this trend from 2020 into 2021 that we have documented in more recent data that we have just published on the Keep It On campaign that talks about the fact that internet shutdowns seem to be becoming longer and seems to be becoming systemic in certain ways. In particular, we've noticed a couple of common trends. One, 
long internet shutdowns in certain regions extending from 2020 into 2021, particularly, as I mentioned, in Jammu and Kashmir, which continues to have internet shutdown restrictions in much more localized pockets across parts of the wider union territory in the current Indian administrative setup, but also shutdowns elsewhere in India, but continuing to happen in that particularly problematic area. You see shutdowns, as you know, continuing to happen in Myanmar, The shutdowns were lifted in Rakhine and Chin temporarily at the beginning of the military coup, but soon followed by nationwide shutdown throttling and nearly institutionalized internet shutdowns now with mobile internet nearly completely switched off, uh, fiber services disrupted earlier, now restored, and the military junta moving to normalize shutdowns by keeping internet shutdowns restricted for all people by whitelisting certain services such as banking or financial operations. So they continue running during the shutdown for banks or, or for political elites, but everyone else continues to suffer. You see a trend of platform shutdowns to mar elections and to control information. But the other trend we notice as particularly relevant to, shut, to this region is shutdowns during protests. Again, something we notice in the context of India, Myanmar, but also something that has come up often in the context of Indonesia, sometimes also related to elections or political activity. I did want to note that there's often a justification made for shutdowns that they help combat disinformation. Uh, not to overstress the role of India, but for example, if you saw comments made by Indian ministers to parliament, they said, oh, shutdowns are part of our standard operating procedure, our toolkit to combat rumors and disinformation that might lead to potential communal violence or other security incidents. And it's important to critique that. And that's one reason why, of course, we have this fantastic session and panel. But I did want to share the words of Irene Khan, the UN's current special rapporteur for freedom of expression and opinion, who has just published an advanced copy of her report on the topic of disinformation and freedom of expression. This is now available on the website of the Office of the High Commissioner of Human Rights for OHCHR. And what they note there, of course, is that courts have ruled against governments that have tried to claim that shutdowns are helpful to combat misinformation, with the example of Indonesia, where the Jakarta Administrative Court ruled against uh, Indonesian government ordered shutdown in, in Papua and West Papua last year. You have seen the UN Special Rapporteur go on a limb to state that it's important to note that shutdowns violate the standard of necessity and proportionality in international human rights law that restricts how states can intrude upon our protected rights to free speech expression and other internationally protected human rights. But more importantly, and I would quote here from the advanced report, it hinders, it hinders voters from accessing information about elections, human rights defenders from documenting and sharing human rights concerns, and journalists and, me and the media from reporting of issues of public interest. By depriving people of information sources, internet shutdowns do not curb disinformation, but rather hamper fact finding and are likely to encourage rumors. In many cases, they appear to be aimed at silencing minority voices and depriving them of access of vital information. And this is something we hope is adopted by the UN Human Rights Council in its current session from June into July. And more importantly, I think as the session will make out, you need, to, you need to carefully assess any government justification of shutdowns. We believe in general that they are never justified, but particularly this more insidious argument that shutdowns help combat misinformation appears to not be borne out by voices on the ground, human rights experts, and that requires us to push back nationally, regionally, and international human rights bodies. And that's something I hope the rights fund community can take forward. And I look forward to further discussion on this to my co-panelists. Back to you, Shalini. Thank you, Raman. Thank you. And I think this is a great way to frame the session. Um, and um, um, I wanted to go to Tai Tai first. Um, Raman, you already talked a little bit about what's happening in Myanmar. Uh, tai, if you can talk about how the military inter's efforts to shut down the internet um, or access to social media platforms, um, how has that affected the lives of citizens? Um, and the operation of the press in Myanmar. Uh, yes, um, thank you. Um, thank you everyone for joining this uh, session as well. So, um, so Myanmar, um, uh, we are not strange, we are not, you know, strange of to internet shutdown because the government and the military has been using it as a weapon of oppression since uh, 2007. And we had also experienced the longest internet shutdown uh, in you know, uh, areas specific such as Rakhine and Chin. And right now, um, uh, since the coup uh, on uh, February 1, uh, internet shutdown had happened in a more uh, complex way uh, and uh, 
and we are still um, experiencing uh, right now. So internet uh, was shut down uh, moment. So for this uh, um, uh, military coup, internet was shut down momentarily on the morning uh, of the coup and followed by a and uh, and a heavy heavy shutdowns after that so because of that of course access to information has become a huge issue particularly in the time of uh, the coup and also in the process uh, in the protests uh, where you know a lot of um, um, uh, you know um, the protests and uh, and and the anti coup uh, movement are um, heavily cracked down with uh, with violence, so um, it definitely impacted, you know, um, the people's ability to access information. Another thing is um, one um, interesting, you know, thing is, although um, although the um, the uh, military had tried to uh, shut down the internet in various way, like for instance, imposing internet curfews uh, at night time or um, shutting down of mobile internet because so that, you know, preventing a protester from uh, communicating and using and also banning off social media platforms and so on and so forth. So despite um, um, all of this, one thing is um, the, um, the military actually uh, learned that, you know, the you know, it's a very, uh, have a big, you know, impact of shutting down the inter internet entirely is actually not, not longer really possible. And then started to whitelist a few, you know, banking on, you know, financial uh, uh, applications and so on and so forth. And then, uh, and then people also are also have been trying to find creative ways to actually come up online. And from some of the statistic, like for instance, when Facebook was banned, uh, normally um, there are 25 millions of active Facebook users for Myanmar daily. But um, uh, with the ban uh, of the, um, the platform, we find that there are still about 10 million of you know, daily users on Facebook. So it means that you know, people you know, had to go through you know, crash courses on how to you know, uh, uh, use the internet in, in a way. So, so, one, so I, I would like to point out that although the military is trying so hard, uh, the people have outsmarted and tried to find ways to actually get around. Get, uh, get around, but still um, a lot of, you know, uh, majority um, populations, uh, particularly, you know, the populations from the ethnic areas and also uh, are actually um, striving to get, uh, striving to get the, the information. And in terms of media, because, um, because uh, after, uh, after the coup, a few weeks after the coup, um, uh, some uh, big media houses has been um, um, revoked of their license. But then, you know, some are some, although some cease to operate, some are still operating on their Facebook uh, platforms and providing a daily news. But then, on the other hand, uh, getting information, getting news from the ground is becoming uh, much more um, difficult because of you know not having uh, you know the sources, you know not having you know uh, internet and so on and so forth. So actually, you know, journalists are also facing a lot of difficulties in time of you know getting uh, information sources and also, you know, getting right information out to the public as well. So in terms of also for me, though, because we also run a fact check uh, uh, platform as well. So, you know, it's also very difficult for us to get, you know, um, uh, accurate information in terms of, you know, um, in, in our work of, um, um, uh, you know, providing uh, fact check um, articles um, as well. So, so, so yes, we have a, a very big, um, 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 impact on access to information, uh, but somehow uh, there are people uh, are managed to outsmart a lot of uh, all these uh, huddles. And then uh, another one is the military uh, actually um, can't afford to close the in internet for a longer time. So they are trying to, you know, find diff different ways to, to do that, but um, but, um, but you know, like I mentioned, uh, people are still trying to outsmart it. And on the other hand, um, the journalists, um, the fact-checking organizations in the country um, um, are also trying to operate in this, um, in this um, situation. And, uh, 
but then at the same time, you know, getting information, getting sources, getting, uh, you know, accurate information out to people are, of course, are, are, are getting very, very difficult in, in this time. Thanks, Tai. Um, and I think that it's encouraging to also see how people are managing to access information, put out information in Myanmar, even during uh, periods of the shutdown. Um, I'd like to go to you now, Kritika, and ask you about the situation in India. Tai talked a little bit about protests in Myanmar and how during uh, the protests, uh, the internet has been shut down. We've seen something similar in India as well. Um, last year in 2020, during the farmers' protests, also in early 2020, during the protests related to the Citizenship Amendment Act, we saw internet being shut down, even in places like Delhi. Um, what was the impact of that on, on your work as a fact checker? Did you see more misinformation um, trending online um, in those periods? And, and how did you address that situation? Um, so firstly, thank you so much, Shalini, for having me on this panel. Um, I want to, uh, so specifically about India, of course, we've seen that whenever there have been protests, there have been, there've, there've been instances of violence. Uh, there have been internet shutdowns and as uh, Raman correctly pointed out and Access Now has really well documented that Jammu and Kashmir in 2019 after the abrogation of Article 370, so one of the longest shutdowns in India. So I think what happens in such a case is that it leads to information blockage because information is not coming out of that area. I think it instead of curbing misinformation, it fuels misinformation and disinformation because you're not able to get any sort of information from that place. You're not able to get verified, authentic information from what is happening on the ground. As an example, um, in August 2019, when this abrogation happened, at that time, there was a narrative which was formed by almost everybody, including the government, which said that the situation in the erstwhile state of Jammu and Kashmir is absolutely normal and people are happy with the decision. Also because there was an internet shutdown, it was difficult to get the information um, out of Jammu and Kashmir. So it became very easy for everybody to believe that everything is hunky-dory, everything is fine, people are happy with the decision. But um, I think it was as late as February 2021 is when 4G was restored. 2G was restored a little before that, but 4G was restored only in February 2021. In fact, the ban which uh, the internet shutdown or the ban which happened uh, on internet services in Jammu and Kashmir was not just restricted to internet, but it was, there was also a ban on landlines. So you're effectively breaking communication. You're effectively putting a stop to communication. Um, again, um, I mean, to come to 2020 because we've seen um, uh, violence in 2020 and then something similar happened in 2021 on 26th of January during the farmers protest. Um, so we've seen all of these instances, we've seen where internet has been shut down. So uh, just to answer your question in one line, no, I don't think so that there is a decrease in misinformation. In fact, uh, there was a lot of misinformation even after this 26th January incident. We saw a lot of people saying online and offline, people saying, relying on clips from what happened at the Red Fort, saying that uh, uh, the farmers or the protesters or uh, people who entered Red Fort, uh, they were raising Khalistan flags. So uh, I think when you block communication, when you stop people from being able to tell others what is happening, it effectively cannot uh, curb misinformation because then you believe whatever you hear and you tend to believe rumors as well. So yeah, that's, that's what I have seen in uh, my experience of fact checking in the last two years. Thanks, thanks Ritika. That's uh, absolutely uh, correct. And I agree that when there is no information coming from the ground, um, whatever you hear and see is often quite distorted and manipulated. And it's even more difficult for people to access credible information. Um, 
why you we'd like to know from your experience of working in Indonesia and also as um, someone who's been working um, on misinformation, on addressing misinformation, uh, human rights issues, especially in Papua and West Papua. What has been your experience of internet shutdowns and how have you addressed that? Thank you, Zalini. Um, good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, wherever you are. Um, uh, I think, uh, first of all, thank you for uh, having me on the panel. I think it's a very important topic. And um, I think what happened in uh, our respective uh, area of the world represent a trend, a worrying trend uh, from governments and authorities uh, just like what Kritika said just now, it, this is a this is a new methods by governments and autocrats to blow to block to block communication to prevent people from exchanging uh, important information. I think that's that's a very uh, worrying trend, and we need to find ways to go around that and find a solution. Um, I'd like to share some of the experience that we have in uh, Papua in Indonesia. Uh, I prepare a short slide, maybe that will help um, explain uh, the uh, what I'm trying to say uh, better with uh, with writings. So uh, first of all, uh, as a background, maybe some of you uh, don't really uh, follow the situation in Indonesia. Uh, internet shutdown uh, is a new thing. Uh, it's just beginning in 2019. It was first introduced uh, in May 2019 after the after a riot happened in the capital, uh, do, uh, just after the election result was announced. Uh, again, the same argument was used here, just like in Myanmar and India. The government blocked uh, social media uh, and chat application, uh, arguing that it's important to uh, prevent misinformation and disinformation. And I will tell you later how that really affect fact checking. So it create uh, an opposite uh, outcome uh, for the uh, for exchanging of uh, credible and important information. Instead of blocking misinformation, it, it creates uh, uh, a more widespread misinformation and disinformation for, for uh, ordinary people. Uh, but the latest case happened, that's what Salini mentioned in Papua. Uh, August last uh, in 2019. Again, the pretext was riot across the province, uh, and then uh, it, this has happened quite uh, long for days until uh, I think uh, one month uh, in Papua. And of course, after that happened, there's a lot of protests uh, all over the country. People are protesting the situation, and they want to see. Uh, changing uh, policy on uh, on uh, internet uh, freedom in, in Indonesia. And people see it, this is a direct threat to freedom of expression uh, and freedom uh, in general in Indonesia. But to, be, to, give you, to give you a more uh, full picture of what happened, Papua has been always a, a conflict area in Indonesia. Has the, the conflict there has been simmering for years, since 1960s. Um, the riot itself in 2019 was 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 triggered by uh, uh, racist uh, remarks made by uh, police, uh, by the law enforcement agencies to the Papuan student in Surabaya, uh, and then uh, the, the 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 racism uh, then uh, uh, protested by the Papuan community all around the country, and they create. Uh, demonstration in, in many cities, but the biggest demonstration was in Papua, and that uh, ferry demonstration lead, led to these uh, riots uh, that used by the government as a pretext to block the internet. Uh, so the, the underlying cause here is the, the, the racism uh, that still exists uh, in many parts of Indonesia towards the, the Papua. Um, if you, this is one uh, example of uh, uh, the incident there, but uh, we also at Tempo Magazine, we publish this uh, incident widely. Uh, and uh, I think that that, cre that helped create public debate around uh, the fate of popcorn and racism in our society. 
um, the problems after the internet shutdown, uh, as I said earlier, fact checking was uh, unable to perform because we need to access a lot of uh, different sources on the ground using local websites. Uh, for instance, uh, after the, uh, in the, the riot in Papua, there's a lot of videos and photos claiming that it was the Papuan shooting uh, police or law enforcement. There have been photos around the internet, uh, spreading around the internet, saying that uh, this is the bodies of uh, you know, soldiers or policemen being shot down with arrows or vice versa. And it creates a lot of confusion because there's, there's, no, there's no way to verify those information when, when we don't have any internet access. Uh, and ordinary citizen, people who are not directly affected by the riot also find it very difficult to know what really happened without uh, the internet available. So even for their own sake, they cannot uh, access, uh, you know, or ways to get out from the, the area or even uh, uh, the, 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 the nature of the conflict and how, how dangerous they are, how close they are with the, with the uh, flare point or the hotspot in the area. Uh, and for the government itself, it's also a big uh, uh, problem because they cannot reach the public, so it's it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's not a situation where you want to get uh, yourself in uh, when there's no way to communicate, uh, uh, you know, even important information about the situation on the ground. Uh, but the, the good thing is, uh, after that internet shutdown, we have we uh, see this uh, huge pushback from civil society. A lot of civil society organizations protested and even filed a lawsuit against the internet shutdown, uh, filed in January 2020 against the president and the, communi the communication and information ministry. And uh, it basically saying that the internet shutdown is, uh, is, uh, is illegal. It's not within the uh, limitation principle enshrined in, uh, in the law, uh, which has been ratified by, by the Indonesian parliament. Uh, and there's a lot of, we, we also were uh, testifying. Uh, one of us, uh, one of our fact checkers from Temple uh, was called as witness in the, in the, in the trial. And we uh, basically saying that uh, with, the, with the internet uh, shutdown, uh, we cannot do our job properly as a fact checking uh, agency uh, for the public, and uh, and we won the case. Uh, the in June uh, 2020, the uh, the civil court saying that uh, the policy to uh, slow down internet or ban internet entirely in Papua was illegal, and su surprisingly, uh, the government accept that decision. They don't appeal, uh, even though they have uh, an opportunity to appeal the case, but they. Uh, said that they accept it and will use it to uh, revise their policy around the uh, same incident in the future. Uh, so for us, I think uh, it's a great achievement to be able to uh, successfully challenge the internet shutdown, but uh, it still is a potential uh, threat that will happen in the future unless we have a, a more legal uh, a more robust legal protection that, that making sure that it will not happen again. Because the only, I think one of the strategy by the government not to appeal is because they don't want this to be strengthened by the higher court or even the Supreme Court, because if that happened, then it's uh, a final and binding. But now it's only the, the first court that say that it's illegal, then they, they still have rooms to maneuver uh, in that sense. So the government, I think we need to engage the government and still still uh, have a lot of homework in making sure the government understand the importance of internet freedom. Uh, and uh, one last thing that really, uh, you know, uh, take us back was, was last month. We also experienced internet shutdown in Papua, but this time there is no announcement. Uh, there is no. Uh, you know, statement from the government saying that, yes, we have blocked the internet as last time, but now the only explanation was there's a, an incident on the undersea internet cable connecting the internet from, uh, from the other island to Papua. So the result is the same. 
and the timing is a bit suspicious because at the time the police is escalating their military operation, their security operation in the area, uh, and they deploy uh, a lot of new uh, troops in the in the region to uh, to confront the separatist movement. At the same time that happened, the internet uh, is uh, is blocked again. But this time the explanation was. Uh, incident on, uh, on the internet cables, not deliberate uh, policy from the government. So I think this is a new way uh, to go around this uh, legal uh, uh, regulation. And I think, uh, of course, this is a, a suspicion because we cannot, uh, we cannot uh, prove for ourselves that there is, an, the, the, there is an incident on the, on the cable uh, under the sea because we cannot you know, go there and check for ourselves. So uh, I think that's from my side and looking forward for the conversation afterwards. Thank you, Selene. Thanks, Vayu. Um, I think um, it, it was uh, really good to listen to all three speakers. And um, also, Vayu, you talked about civil society putting pressure on the government, uh, the victory that you had about uh, the internet shutdown being declared illegal in Indonesia. Um, and similarly, in Myanmar, we've seen uh, civil society being very active, also people moving to offline um, um, tools that, that can be used to share information even during shutdowns. I wanted to ask Raman at this point that what are some of the strategies um, that people have uh, adopted in other countries and maybe other regions during internet shutdowns? And how can we ensure that um, during certain important events, especially during elections, which are so important for democracies, uh, people do have access to credible information and internet shutdowns and network disruptions don't take place? Thank you, Shalini. I'm very happy to answer that. And in fact, as I before I go into that question about strategy and how do people react and try to mitigate or circumvent it, I thought I'd just emphasize one point that you know I think came from those other speakers is that what shutdowns particularly also do with misinformation is it makes it difficult to signal to people that what you're seeing right now is misinformation, disinformation. And what I mean by that is a fact checker may even determine X picture or message that is being sent or is being spread even perhaps by word of mouth is untrue, but you can't easily spread it. And you can't publicly notify that something is uh, misinformation. Sometimes that's unintentional and it uh, may not be the per intention of government, but it actually does cause harm. Other cases we must also recognize it might be intentional sometimes by politically, by politically connected actors or dominant interests to prevent misinformation from being revealed. But leave that aside, how are people responded? I think people have tried to do the effort of trying to circumvent or see other technical ways around that. And there are a variety of mechanisms. There's some more low tech tools, such as, for example, people sometimes using SIM cards on roaming in, in countries where the local telecom operator has said that we will not implement the shutdown against roaming customers. I know, for example, that's partly been true in Myanmar to a limited extent, a few other countries as well. But again, that's intermittent. It depends on, say, the telecom operator in the country. And for example, in certain cases, such as Jammu and Kashmir in India in 2018-19, that wasn't an option because they did a full communications blackout. And subsequent to that, they in particular also targeted people who might have been roaming in the state. But again, that varies from country to country. You see others who try to circumvent by using uh, uh, you know, peer-to-peer -peer messaging apps. And what I mean by that are apps such as Fire, Fire, Fire Chat or others that are basically depend on mesh networking. It means connects from one mobile device to another mobile device using Wi-Fi or other local transmission and not through the cellular towers. I will note there that the use case of that as a circumvention tool has actually been something I would say many people in the Keep It On community are critical of. The data doesn't seem to back up their actual use, including in situations like Hong Kong, like Myanmar, like other places. And there's a lot of worry about potential surveillance and vulnerabilities in such platforms. Because remember, the one thing I would say in doing shutdowns is we know a shutdown is happening. We don't always know the surveillance that may be taking place. And who particularly journalists and sometimes, unfortunately, even fact checkers, they need to be careful about that. There are other low tech solutions, or you could say, old tech solutions, for example, using radio spectrum broadcasts. I know some people in, again, Myanmar or in other countries have said, if something is not available on social media or local messaging, have it broadcast by 
radio broadcasters regionally or internationally because they can often still be available, particularly AM spectrum broadcasters. But again, that's limited. It's not as nimble as people would like. But those sort of old school tech solutions are sometimes what we may go to. Uh, and the other thing is that they are digital security and other tools that, for example, even our Access Now Digital Security Helpline has been thinking of. I can share, we hope to publish more on this later this month and next month. There are already some great resources from Southeast Asian digital security networks about Myanmar in particular. And I know, uh, you know, the community and our wider network that Setai and others represent or work with have information on digital security tips. But there's more that we can do there. But as a policy person, I keep emphasizing that you will not be able to circumvent or route around a shutdown easily. People may, for example, an independent broadcaster or fact checker may go to an area where shutdown, come back, use, say, a fixed connection to email. But ultimately, in fact, if you focus on circumvention too much, we won't solve the bigger problem, which is that, in my view, and I think the view we could perhaps arrive at after all these discussions and data, is that shutdowns are never acceptable. And we must ensure whether it's through policymakers, courts, international institutions, or just the force of our popular will or political pressure that a shutdown is never allowed to occur. But I hope we can focus on that. And again, I'm happy to come back to that later in our discussion. Yeah, I hope we can definitely focus on that uh, in the region. Uh, Kritika, as a fact checker and as someone who's um, leading the work of WebGoof, a fact checking group, I wanted to ask you about the, um, about the misinformation and maybe give a few examples of misinformation that you've seen during the shutdowns and how have you addressed uh, this kind of misinformation? Um, so Charlie, one example is something that I gave earlier as well, was a very, very prominent narrative which was created by the government uh, when internet shutdown happened in Jammu and Kashmir saying that everything is very, everybody is happy, everything is fine, but that is not the case because we had our own reporters visiting Jammu and Kashmir, and they got us reports showing that people were not happy. We got a, uh, they got us reports from hospitals which showed there were casualties. We, we had a lot of those reports. So, I mean, of course, uh, since not everybody sitting in Delhi is able to get in touch with people in Jammu and Kashmir, it will become very difficult for you to show that accurate picture. And also, without naming any uh, particular media house or without naming anything, I would say that a large chunk of the media also rallied the government's view they did also show uh they did it i'm sorry they did also show that everything was smooth in the valley everything was uh fine in jammu and kashmir so i think that is an example of misinformation because that is not the whole picture that didn't reveal the real situation on the ground and it became difficult unless uh, report and also you know it became difficult for reporters to file reports from Jammu and Kashmir and send it here because it was very difficult for them to send it because there was a shutdown or uh, maybe they had access to uh, low bandwidth internet it wasn't as simple so I think that is a very um, prominent example that I can think of uh, other than that even during the anti-CAA NRC protests which happened uh, which started in December 2019 and they uh, snowballed into riots that we saw in Delhi in February 2022. We have seen examples, we have seen how misinformation is uh, targeting a particular community, how narratives are built, uh, targeting protesters, protesting students, uh, activists. So there are ample examples and uh, I, I, at least I haven't seen evidence which supports this argument which says that shutdowns have actually helped in curbing misinformation. So while that could be um, an argument put forth by the government, I do not think that is backed by data or maybe that's not backed by enough data. So yeah, that's that's what I would like to say. I, I'd like to ask you about Mido. Uh, Mido is also a fact-checking group and you've been fact-checking um, misinformation related to several issues, including the elections and uh, the uh, political instability in Myanmar. Uh, what has been the example of uh, um, the experience of Mido uh, during shutdowns? And if you can give some examples of the kinds of misinformation that you've seen during shutdowns and how have you addressed that? 
Uh, yes, um, so um, during this shutdown, uh, we have, uh, we continue to actually see a lot of, you know, harmful uh, propaganda that, you know, that uh, the at scale. And also, you know, it's, um, you know, we can also see that, you know, it's actually very linked to, you know, uh, what the propaganda that we are seeing on social media, uh, linking to the military um, um, TV channels, and and you know, and also you know all this, um, you know how propaganda and you know the state, you know official, you know the the um, so-called official um, media that the military back are linked together. So so this is uh, this is actually very interesting to see. And also during the, the internet shutdown, uh, we, we, we see a lot of all this propaganda and misinformation. But one thing very uh, notable that we still remember is, you know, uh, during the first uh, month of the coup, uh, when, you know, the total uh, internet shutdown had happened, uh, a misinformation, uh, you know, about, you know, Do Aung San Suu Kyi being re released from her arrest came, uh, you know, came up and people are actually, you know, uh, messaging to each other about it, sending SMS and it's a, it, it's a, it's, it's a very coordinated uh, message because, you know, uh, suddenly, you know, uh, people uh, are receiving on their um, on their phones. Some, you know, people are receiving calls from their friends, and then. As Mido, because we were doing, we we are, you know, uh, we also have a fact check team. People tend to call us to, you know, help ask us to confirm about that news. And then it's actually very difficult for us to confirm it because, you know, because we actually don't have internet. It's very, you know, uh, hard for us and dangerous for us to call, you know, risky for us to call people who are actually close to, you know, the um, the Aung San Suu Kyi or the government. But we managed to confirm that it is not true. So so we don't know how to actually pass that news because there's no internet. So and then at the same time, you know, the all you know people from like the neighborhoods are celebrating. There's even like fireworks, and you know, we even hear all of these things because people are celebrating. And then you know, what what we have to do is you know, you know, we have to do like very community based fact checking at that time. So you know, our fact checkers, we just you know, we we just had to go out to the balcony and then shout about, okay, this is not true. Don't believe it. Just please pass this message to whoever you see. And then we started sending SMS and all of this. So it really take a very, uh, you know, you know, uh, like a, a night and a day to actually, you know, uh, uh, verify, you know, on, on that information. So that's, you know, that that is that show that, you know, misinformation, uh, some disinformation somehow make its way uh, coordinatedly. But then on the other hand, our fact check um, um, group, uh, we, we had difficulties in actually trying to, you know, verify and combat it and, you know, uh, and, you know, and to reach it to the people. So, so that's very like a notable experience that we have for the Myanmar case. Yeah, it's a very, uh, very, very powerful experience, Tai. And uh, I remember when the coup happened in Myanmar in February, we were all trying to look for um, credible information from Myanmar and trying to look at independent media sites, some of which had been blocked, some social media platforms had been blocked. So putting out um, information, factual information in this manner is, is really great. Um, I'd like to ask you, Vayu, now about Indonesia and something similar that happened during the elections uh, in Indonesia when you saw social media platforms not being available um, when the election results uh, were being declared. So what was the experience of fact-checking of Tempo and Check Fakta during that time? Yeah, uh, I think, uh, first of all, uh, the government claimed that that the policy was uh, in place to prevent misinformation, right? Because uh, uh, you know, just after midnight, the, the election was announced at 7 or 8 p.m., uh, if I'm not mistaken. Then after uh, midnight, we start seeing riots everywhere in the capital. And uh, nearing down, we start uh, 
receiving a lot of photos uh, and videos about uh, classes or uh, between the rioters or, or demonstrators uh, with the police and you know pictures of uh, bodies claiming to be victims of uh, you know the police violence so what really happened is not the it's not the government trying to prevent misinformation but the government trying to prevent the public to know that there is victims from the public uh, that be that was being sought uh, by the police enforcement by, by the by the law enforcement that's that's what happened because the the riots got uh, out of control and the government then the police start taking uh, you know uh, measures to prevent it and that's result in uh, a lot of victims uh, people being shot and, and etc that's the information that the governments want to prevent people from knowing so there is no disinformation at the time uh, but of course these videos and photos needs to be checked there's the the slowdown of uh, social media access the made uh, it's difficult for fact checkers to know exactly where that comes from because if you have uh, Facebook or YouTube still exists, you can track the the source. You can track the the users who who spread it uh, uh, in the first place. You can uh, track the location of the place uh, of the from the from the users using the analytics provided by the social media. But if that's gone and people spreading that through you know, websites or email, just being sending the link. Uh, and uh, it's, it becomes more difficult for fact checkers to verify where uh, the origin of that particular video or photo because there's no uh, data about the source. Uh, the other thing that also happened is because there's the, a slowdown of social media use, but only in the capital, we start seeing disinformation, unverified information uh, spread or share widely outside of the capital. And you know, that make the tension becomes more national, uh, a conflict that should be localized in one city become, you know, become more uh, widespread because you know, uh, the, the, the limitation of social media application is only in the capital and people outside the capital still can access it, but they didn't get information or uh, fact check information about what really happened. Uh, we'll be wrapping up this session in about uh, five to seven minutes from now. And um, I wanted to ask uh, Kritika, Tai, and Vayu to um, maybe talk about your, uh, your vision and, and your idea as activists, journalists, and fact checkers um, in the region. What kind of information flow is necessary? And how would you prepare for such situations of shutdowns in the future? Um, Kritika, would you like to start? Sure. Um, so uh, I, what I want to say is that we completely acknowledge the fact that there is a lot of misinformation. And uh, of course, the government needs to act. But what we also need to acknowledge is the fact that uh, maybe internet shutdown is not the solution. You look, you need to step back and take a look at the larger problem and we need uh, a solution to fix that problem and not a shutdown or a ban on, or, or a ban of any sort. So I, uh, number one, so I don't think so that is the solution. Um, so this argument that internet shutdown is for national security or is for curbing the spread of misinformation at least uh, when it comes to misinformation, I don't think so that is a permanent solution or that is a strong enough reason to uh, say that this is the reason why there is an internet shutdown. Number two, I feel that uh, what happens in a situation when you impose a shutdown, the situation is anyway volatile. There is a lot of information. I'm not saying misinformation or disinformation. I'm saying there is a lot of unverified information. It might be true. It might be wrong. So you need to give that time to people to, you know, uh, uh, process that information to know what is right and what is wrong. In that process, when you uh, shut down the internet, 
when you say that you cannot access these apps or these messaging apps or you put a ban on landline or whatever you make it even more difficult and that is when people start relying on rumors when that is when people start believing whatever they are hearing that could be word of mouth that could be anything um so i think that is something which needs to be addressed um and number 3 is i think as uh misinformation also goes offline because of course when there is a shutdown we again we acknowledge the fact that misinformation is just not on platforms it's also through word of mouth so if misinformation goes offline i think facts also need to go offline so since you are asking for a future view um i think one thing um individually in my opinion i think what is important is to also amplify the work that all of us are doing all the fact checkers are doing as a community we need to amplify these facts offline so that they are able to reach a larger audience maybe in uh, their language in local languages not just english hindi or whichever language we are producing our content in so yeah i think those are three major points that i would like to make thanks kritika tai uh, what are your thoughts on this uh, yes uh, i i completely agree with kritika on the point that you know uh, shutting down the internet is by no way a mean to cut misinformation and because it's also not you know justifiable as well so you know this is um, you know this uh, this uh, message should be you know very clear and also um, we have to have like a, a, avid you know uh you know have uh data to actually you know we need data to support that as well because in Myanmar during the previous uh, NLD government uh which we you know regard it which can be regarded as uh you know a uh, starting of a democratic government we we had the the you know one of the longest internet shutdown and also doing this military coup we you know the you know the um, the, the military are using this switch to you know easily um um you know um, oppress the people so you know uh, so this 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 shouldn't happen this couldn't happen so you know uh, i think that we should have more data to back that you know this is not a solution to the you know the to the to the to the problem so so i agree on that and another one is internet shutdowns are it's just one part of a complex system of you know government control you know the you know there are also you know a way of you know surveillance you know arrest you know and all of this regulations on access so i think that you know um i think that you know this should also be um clearly um you know um be aware and you know also have you know enough tactics for us to actually work on that as well so yes so that is just what i want to say thank you thank you tai by you any um, last comments on this yeah i completely agree with uh, what kritika and tai just said uh, but just to add one point maybe that uh, we need to find or thinking uh, about alternative uh, inter- internet infrastructure uh there is a lot of technology uh, that is available for civil society uh to you know just to be ready when there's a, a big potential if there's a huge potential that it can happen in a region where tension is high or conflict conflict prone region i think uh, it's a it's a it's a it's some something that the civil society needs to think about uh, really creating this uh, alternative infrastructure of uh, internet access because if you take down if you remove the internet there's there's no way we can uh control the government there's no way we can access what really happened on the ground and that is a deadly recipe for human rights violation for a lot of uh, wrong doings and crimes committed so i think it's it's paramount uh, uh, we start thinking about that if that uh, if the if the variable on the ground uh shows that it's it's necessary yeah um it's it's quite clear from what all of you are saying and and from our own experience mm-hmm. we know that internet shutdowns are just not acceptable and whether we're working as journalists or fact checkers it's really difficult for function and for citizens uh, it becomes a life threatening situation so raman um uh, i'd like you to end this by um sharing your final thoughts on 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 this what can we all do 
um, as a community working on um, information and credible information, online information in the region? What can we all do? And I think the answer to that, Talini, is we will try and make some things better. We will try and figure out ways to circumvent alternative technologies. But I think we now know this is a problem. And I think in our voices, as people involved in the Asian journalism, fact-checking communities, we need to speak in the region in one voice and in our local languages in our countries to say, hey, there is a problem of misinformation which policymakers recognize and are wanting more action. Fact-checkers are doing that job, the hard job already. Shutdowns don't just make our job harder. It makes spreads more information and makes it much worse. This is something that predates a digital era, but is much worse today and people expect more. So do not issue a shutdown. It makes our situation far more problematic. And we therefore believe and should in one voice that in 2021, shutdowns need to be recognized as one of the worst uh, not impediments for fact-checking and perhaps one of the worst perpetrators of misinformation and disinformation. And we need that voice out clear in our local language, in our countries, in national capitals, in the region, and of course internationally as well, because I think it's not just to the West or other actors, it's to us who work in this, who stay in our countries, who are trying to make them better places to be able to say this here and have recognition of that. And I think we're well placed because fact checkers are doing the hard work already. And I think they can put that voice out more clearly saying this is not acceptable. And then slowly and slowly we will win this fight. We know the problem and hopefully we'll get to the solution. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And I hope that next year when we have the report on internet shutdowns, we see fewer shutdowns and we are all able to fight this together. Thank you for joining us and thank you to all the panelists for uh, your thoughts and experiences.